Hey, it's Thomas Mulready from CoolCleveland.com. We're here at Axpona 2016 with Prudence Farrell Bruns. You have just written a book, and strangely enough, called Dear Prudence, because you are the prudence of that song. And tell me just first of all, what, what has that been like all these years later for, for probably your entire life since that song came out? I'm sure it's had an effect on your, on your life. Um, it has and it hasn't. I mean, of course. Uh, when it first came out, I denied it in the sense that uh, everybody had their own idea of why the Beatles, why John wrote that song, and and I, you know, I knew the real reason. But when I would explain it to people, it was too long an explanation as to why I would prefer to be in my room than be with them. Uh, yeah. So you were in your tent, is what I understood, and well, wouldn't not. come out. And John was sort of wrote this song to entice you to come out. That's kind right, of right. Um, sort of, yeah. I wanted to meditate, and um, like many people my own age at that time, it was a time of transition. It looks, you know, sort of romantic now, but it was actually a very difficult time for a lot of us. We went through a kind of collective uh, identity crisis, which that John and George also went through in a way and uh, so we had a lot in common we were in the same Puri it's called in in India and Hindi but it, it's meant we were in the same building a little kind of cottage building um, that we sh a bungalow building that we shared and they were on the course and I was on the course and we were there to meditate for three months we were there for a long time and Brian Epstein had just passed away it was a real shock to really I guess everybody in that inner circle I, I think it was. I mean, when somebody dies, you realize the world isn't like Disney, you know, a Disney world that it's real, that, that you can lose things. And it can be, a, it's a wake up call. And I'm not sure. I mean, when I would talk with them, they did not talk about that that much. We talked about why we came, which the reason that they were there with John. Uh, kept saying was because of George and George said that the reason he was there was because he had had his first psychedelic experience in um, San Francisco and that was the first time that he saw there was more dimension to this world and that uh, there's a part of all of us that can be universal and so that changed his whole perspective and he began to want to uh, find out more about that and so meditation was a way to do that and he, but all of us were there kind of not knowing what our generation was going through we were questioning everything we were questioning what our parents the direction they had gone where it had taken us which was on the brink of a third world war and all of that and so we were looking for a way to make a better world and to take uh, the thinking maybe in a, in a different direction, which was inward. And so going to India was part of that journey, which a lot of us were making. That's why it got so much attention. And that's why the Beatles, even though their music is amazing, it was more, or it was their music, but it was also what they represented, which was the collective consciousness of a lot of us. They were our voice. And they were going through what we were going through. And so there we talked about things like that. What, what, what did it mean? What, why were we going to this kind of far out exotic part of the world and spending three months doing nothing but meditating? And um, so the, those kinds of questions were the things we discussed. And, and the main you know, person, the reason John was there was because of George, who, who said that what he had found through going deep inside was that there was such a thing as peace. You know, that when we talk about world peace, we're not just talking about the absence of violence. We're talking about a state of being, you know, where we're actually giving off peace and, and living peace. And so he was talking about bringing that back into the world, you know, spending time meditating and and learning more about it so that he could, through his music, be able to let people know there was more inside them.
Did you feel that the music that came out of that period, because they, they spent so much time in India writing all the songs that ended up on the White Album, really, yeah. including Dear Prudence, um, when you heard that album come out, did you feel that these things that you're talking about, this, this search for peace, this search for a new way, did you sense it in, in the music then that you heard them make, or, or did it come out differently than, than you would have imagined? Well, I know that when they went through the psychedelic area, it came out in the music, which we were all going through that, not just them. I mean, a large amount of us. But uh, yes, a lot of the White Album did give that off. And in a way, I felt that Dear Prudence, with its kind of haunting sort of mel kind of melody and things, that captured that India course more than any of the others. So I, I felt actually honored that my song of all of the songs in that album from my perspective captured the essence somewhat of that course of that time of going deep inside um, but I some of the songs did but not like the earlier music which really was psychedelic I mean this the music from that album I don't think really was transformative for consciousness but I do think that George who was the one who really wanted to bring that change. This was George talking, not John so much. Um, I think he did with his music try and, and do that, but that's why he was studying the sitar and ragas, which the ragas are, are you know, a Gandharva Veda, which is a... So he, he was trying to um, do that with, with the sitar. George took it a lot more seriously, spent a lot more time there. He, he took his, his guitar practice, his art, and, and integrated it with the sitar, with the Indian, with the musicians. And he said that the point of that, besides him loving what he was doing, was a challenge, was to, to awaken in people that, that deeper part of them, that mo those more universal parts of their, of their soul that are silent. You know, this is very idealistic and altruistic. I, I wonder if this was also towards the end of the 60s, which the hope for peace and love it didn't end well, you know, the 60s didn't end well. I mean, how did you feel when there was all this hope and all this, you know, work, really hard work and months and months of work, and then when it, when it all came out, it, it just seemed to crumble. I, I mean, what was your feeling about that? Well, my feeling uh, is that the reason we came together, which was the magic of the 60s, is that all of us were on the same page. We were all going through an identity crisis together. We didn't know what the future held, but we knew we couldn't go the, in the direction we had. We were doing psychedelic drugs, but we knew that couldn't be sustained. But we were discovering the inner world, and we were also questioning all of the outer and rejecting. So that was a difficult time, but it was a time that everybody was on the same, a lot of us were on the same page. And of course, there was the war, which was very powerful, and a lot of people were just on that page, but the people that were like George and myself and John to some extent, um, we were, it was magic, but it was painful. But it was because of the pain that we, and what we were going through that brought us together. Once that pain began to dissipate, once we found meditation and we found some peace and things started to work for us again, then we started moving back into the culture and the, the magic of all of us being one voice together began to dissipate. And that was the loss, in a sense, of the 60s. We still had that in us, but we were distracted. We had kids, we had to work, we had to make money. We had to sort of, we disbanded. We didn't share that common thread where we were trying to survive. Who were we? I remember uh, hitchhiking from New York to Boston and people would just pick me. I did that a lot <laughs> and when I was young in like 65, 66, 67 and um, people, we, we'd, I'd just get picked up and we'd be like on the same page instead of saying, oh isn't the weather beautiful? We would be right out what are you going through? You know, what, how do you feel our future is? What do you think is going to happen? All of this kind of stuff. So that, that was magic in that sense, but it was a painful time. So when that dissipated and we all had to sort of survive, it went away, but we still lived to a great degree what we believed. I know I did. I know my husband did. I know a lot of my friends did. But it wasn't one voice, so it wasn't loud. But now we're retiring. 
And there's a young generation, which my, grandchild, my grandchildren are, especially uh, the 20-year-olds, 18-year-olds, and they're the ones that are looking, they're listening to the um, music of the Beatles, which means they're hearing our voice from then. And they're asking questions that we asked. And they're looking for answers that we were looking for. And um, that's what made me write the book. That's honestly what made me write the book. When I met his friends and they asked me things about, you know, why did I believe in world peace, all of these things, it made me realize that because they were still hearing while our voice was being heard, I had a responsibility to tell my story, which is very much typical of the 60s group that went through this that now influences our, you know, for a long time I felt we didn't even make an impact is what I thought. But I began to see that recently when I saw those kids, I began rethinking and saying, well, look, we've got yoga. We've got 40 million people doing yoga. We've got these organic uh, people looking at how they eat. We've got green movements. So a lot of things have happened. Maybe the world hasn't become peaceful, but I think more and more more and more people are living with those ideas. And, and so I, anyway, I felt my voice would needed to be heard since I was Dear Prudence. And I was very typical of a, of a group of people. I would tell my story. Right. And that song, as you said, it, it has a special place in the album because of where it comes right at the very beginning. It's, it's got a mood. It has the finger picking that they, John picked up just a few days before he, he probably wrote the song from Donovan, who was there as well, who also was very serious about this. So some were a little more serious than others. Ringo couldn't digest the food and didn't stay very long. He didn't, Ringo didn't stay long at all. But I'll tell you one thing that was fascinating about all four of them was I had been raised in Hollywood and met a lot of famous people all my life. And it was usually a great disappointment, especially if you loved their, their talent. And so my feeling when I went to India and heard the Beatles were coming was I didn't want to meet them. You know, I didn't want to go through that whole thing where they thought they were better than other people and, you know, this kind of, yeah. Um, but I was not disappointed by any, all four. Now, Paul, and, and Paul still meditates, Ring, Ringo still meditates, but they were not, you're right, they were not into all of this change that that group that I was a part of were, were really into the way John and, I mean, uh, George and John yeah. do it. So you were a part of this idealistic moment in time that's captured forever. And, and in a way, it's been magnified. I have to say thank you for, for being a part of that because it still lives on every time somebody drops a needle in that record and sings along yes. and thinks about yes. what that meant. Yes. That's even more powerful than, than maybe what happened since then because it still lives on. That's, it, it's beautiful what you just said. And that's why I wrote my book. And I think that it'll be also a powerful story for that history, for that history. We can believe that good things can happen and we could have a world in peace if enough of us, you know, do the work, which means we, we make ourselves better people and we start to live peace from inside. And, and peace is creative. It's not inertia. It's not dead, but it's... It's alive, and, uh, and we can all be much more tapped into it. Thank you difference. so much for taking time here and, and talking about this. You've met so many people here. You're so gracious, and I know you have to run now. Thank you. It's, it's a real honor to meet you, yeah. and thank you for being here. Yeah, ditto. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hey, it's Thomas Mulready from CoolCleveland.com. Have a great week in cool Cleveland.